Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, that was asking you to turn off your telephones. If you would please do that, that would be great. Um, we are live streaming uh, tonight's event on the web. So anything that you say tonight will be captured for the world to hear. So um, if you have a distinctive ringtone, now is the time to silence your phone uh, so that it doesn't appear clipped by your kids at your next uh, birthday party. Um, my name is Matthew Kalman, and uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you here tonight on behalf of Bet Avichai and the Times of Israel. Uh, tonight, we are, I have uh, a, an author uh, who has just completed his third book. His first two won an enormous amount of acclaim and prizes. Um, I've read this one. It looks like this one is going to do even better. Please welcome the author of Spies of No Country, Matty Friedman. Thank you for wearing a, a jacket and tie and making me look bad. <laughs> one of us, one of us had to, one of us had to. Um, Matty, we hear a lot about the word Mistaravim. Uh, particularly people who are fans of Fauda uh, will have come across that, that word. And um, explain to us what that word means and how it ties in with the, with the theme of, of your new book. Sure. First of all, thank you so much for coming. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I don't know how many Fauda fans there are here. Yeah. No. Okay. I guess we'll just talk about that then. Uh, in, in Fauda, as you all obviously know, uh, the main characters are Israeli agents who are capable of assuming Arab identities and kind of crossing, crossing the lines. That job in Israel has a word, it has a name, kind of a strange name. It's mistarvim, that's the word in Hebrew. And that is a very interesting word. The, the word has no English translation. The closest you can come to a, a literal translation is ones who become like Arabs, mistarvim. And the fact that there's a word in Hebrew for that action is very strange. There's a verb, l'histarev, you can conjugate it. The word uh, has its roots in the intelligence community here in the story of Spies of No Country. The first people to use that word to describe what they're doing are these guys who are at the center of this book. They didn't want to call themselves spies because they thought that was dishonorable. They didn't want to call themselves agents. That sounded not, not really respectable. So they needed another word to describe what they were doing. And interestingly, the word they chose has a very um, long and interesting history that predates the Zionist movement. In the lives of the Jews of Arab countries, the word mistarvim had a different meaning. For example, in Aleppo, Syria, where there was an ancient Jewish community, a community that was ancient, by the way, when the Second Temple was destroyed. So we're talking about one of the oldest Jewish communities. There were always two groups of Jews in the city. There were Sfaradim, who came from Spain after the expulsion from Spain in 1492. And there were Jews who had been in Aleppo forever, but who had adopted Arab culture and Arabic language after the arrival of Arab conquerors in the seventh century. And because they adopted Arab culture, they called themselves those who become like Arabs. In Arabic, musta'arabim. In Hebrew, mista'arvim. Jews who become like Arabs. So at the very inception of Israeli intelligence in the 1940s, they pull that word, that kind of strange word, out of the history of Jews of Arab lands, and they apply it to something new, which is intelligence work. And to this day, that word is in use in real life and in TV series like Fauda. Now, Israel is a place, as we've seen this week, where not much happens. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a quiet backwater um, with uh, not a lot of stuff going on in, in the public uh, uh, arena. Uh, a boring place, yes, what one might say. Um, well, it's so nice to have an event like this to kind of exactly. give us something to think about. Exactly. Um, uh, and it's also a place that's, that's, well, there have been some things happening here this week. Um, uh, tomorrow, um, Israel is going to land uh, a spaceship on the moon. Um, why should we be interested with all that's going on here in Israel, with all that's going on in, in contemporary life, in all that's going on with regard to the, the future 
which in this case also involves space travel as well as Israel's other amazing technical achievements. What do we get from looking back 70, 80 years to see what these guys were doing then? What, what relevance does it have for us today? First of all, I think that looking at the results of the election, some people are considering space travel uh, <laughs> as perhaps one of, the better, one of the better political options that we have this week. Um, <laughs> the, the reason to be interested in this story beyond the fact that I think it's a pretty good spy story and, and I'm, I'm drawn to story, uh, stories about double identity and espionage, and I think many people are, but the, I, have, I have a different idea in mind in this book and that is trying to tell a different story about what Israel is. So I came to Israel in 1995, I was born in Toronto, and I moved here when I was 17, and I came here with a set of fairly simple stories about the country, most of which were European stories. So I knew about Herzl, and I knew about pogroms in Europe, and I knew about um, the kibbutz movement, and the Holocaust, of course, and those stories are very important if you want to understand why Israel was founded. But I discovered when uh, I arrived here that those stories actually don't explain the country. So if you have those stories as a map and you try to navigate Israel in 2019, the country makes no sense. And there are many reasons for that. But one of the main reasons is that half of the Jews in Israel come from the Islamic world and have very little to do with that story that I just sketched out in very kind of uh, general terms. Half of the Jews in Israel have roots in places like Baghdad which was one-third Jewish in the 1940s. Uh, Casablanca, Tehran, Isfahan, Aleppo. Uh, a million Jews lived in the Islamic world in the 1940s. They were native to the Islamic world, and that world was almost completely erased, and most of it moved here. And those newcomers who came after 1948 have shaped everything about this country. They shaped the political life of the country in many ways, some of which we just saw this week. Um, they shape cuisine, they shape pop music, if you turn on a pop station, you're gonna hear music that doesn't sound like Western music. And um, none of this makes sense unless you understand that this is a Middle Eastern country as much as it is anything else. But our stories don't explain that because we still tell the same old stories about the country, Ben Gurion and Golda Meir, and those are important people and very important stories, just so I'm not misconstrued. Those people were geniuses and I think that their genius only becomes more and more clear as time goes on. But it's a partial story and there's a huge hole in it and that hole needs to be filled. So what I was trying to do in this book is tell a story about the creation of the state in which the main characters had nothing to do with Europe. They'd never been to Europe. They were kids basically from, from around here. Two of them were Syrians, one of them was Yemeni, and the fourth character in the book was born here in Jerusalem under, uh, under the British mandate and grew up in Nakhlaot speaking Arabic, both because his friends were Arabic-speaking Jews, and because some of his friends were Arabic-speaking Muslims. And if you understand the founding of the state through their eyes, the state looks different. Not just 1948, but 2019 looks different. And I remember walking out of one conversation with the only surviving uh, spy, um, and I kind of left a conversation with him, and I, I felt that the country that I saw on the street looked different. I just saw the place differently, and the Jews from the Islamic world were no longer a footnote to a European story, but they were in the center of the story, and it almost seemed as if the Jews who came from Europe were maybe a footnote to a story that's fundamentally a story about the Middle East. So I think that we still tell the story of Israel as if the Jews from the Islamic world joined the story of the Jews of Europe. I think we still think, many of us still think that way. This is a European story, and then it was joined by Jews from, from the Islamic Middle East. But if you think about it, and if we understand that half of the Jews here come from the Islamic world, and if you understand that we're in the Islamic world, then I think you can flip it, and I think you can understand this country as being a story about European Jews or the remnants of that world joining the story of the Jews of Islam. The main characters here might be the Jews of the Islamic world, and it's just a different way to see it. So I tried to tell a story about the foundation of the state with no Ashkenazim. The, the, the characters here are all uh, from the Islamic world and they're the stars of the show. They're not, uh, they're not on the margins. But despite the fact that they're the stars of the show, as you say, and the four main characters who we'll talk about in a second are all from those uh, Arab, Arab backgrounds and Arab, Arabic speaking backgrounds, um, the, their, their commanders and the people who actually operate them and send them into the field are not. Uh, and even though there were so many Jews from Arab countries, uh, 
th their, their position in Israeli society was interesting. Um, their position even in these units where they were was, was interesting. You, you tell the story at one point about, I, I think it's Gamliel, uh, who's one of your four main characters, who found that he was uh, expected to put on a kind of a, a, a kind of Arabic pageant for the Palmach leadership with campfires and roasting lambs, um, or almost like a circus troupe while, while he was in the camp. What, what did you discover about the attitude of the handlers and officers to these, to, to these people who they were about to send off possibly to their deaths? So Gamliel is a good example. Uh, Gamliel was born in Damascus. Uh, his name when he was a kid was Jamil. Jamil Cohen, that was his name. And he decided when he was in his late teens, early 20s, that he had to get out of the Arab world and he wanted to join the Zionist movement. He wanted to be a new Jew along the lines of what was being imagined by European Zionists at that time. And he runs away from Syria, arrives in British Mandate Palestine, which is very close. So for European Jews fleeing to the Middle East, this was some great journey, but for Gamliel it was, you know, a couple hours. He ends up on a kibbutz and he wants to be a chalutz, he wants to be a pioneer. But he found that the, the people on the kibbutz weren't eager to let him in because he was, dif he was different at that time. In the 1940s, nine out of every ten Jews here came from, from Europe, mostly Eastern Europe, from the world of, y of Yiddish and from that incredible doomed uh, Jewish world in Europe, and they didn't know what to make of these people who spoke Arabic, who seemed like Arabs. Jamil Cohen is a name that makes no sense to European Jews. So he changes his name, he uses his Hebrew name, he starts calling himself Gamliel Cohen, and he tries to integrate into the society of the kibbutz with mixed success. He can't quite break in. And after doing that for a while, right at the, at around the time of the end of the Second World War, a recruiter for a very small Palmach outfit calling itself the Arab section, Hamachlaka Ha'aravit, which ends up being one of the seeds of the Mossad, but at the time was just a completely ad hoc little operation. They arrive on the kibbutz and they spot this guy, Gamliel, but they don't want Gamliel. They want Jamil, because they need people who can cross enemy lines and be mistarvim and assume Arab identities. So they need him to be like an Arab, which is precisely the thing that was preventing him from integrating into the society as he desired. He, he just wanted to be a chalutz, he wanted to be like everyone else. His Arabness prevented him from doing this. And then the Palmach, which is the holy of holies of the Zionist movement, they arrive and say, we want you, but we want you as an Arab. So they take Gamliel, who's reverted to being Jamil, to the Arab section. And in the Arab section, he's given a third identity. Now his name is Yusuf El Hamed, and he's a Palestinian Muslim. And under that identity, he's sent back into the Arab world as a spy, but the Arab world is where he's from. It's his native world. So the levels of confusion and kind of identity, uh, blurry identities are one of the most interesting things about, about this story. So the Palmach is this, you know, this legendary outfit, this radical socialist uh, militia that uh, is key to the founding of the state. It's almost all European Jews, except more or less for this one section, Hamachlaka Aravit. And in the Palmach, in a strange way, they venerate Arabness. They love the, their idea of Arabs. They like to wear a kafia and they use a lot of Arabic in their Hebrew. A lot of the Arabic that is still in our Hebrew comes from these guys, uh, sahbak, that kind of word. Um, and there are many, many others, some of them um, unrepeatable in, uh, in, mixed, in mixed company, but a lot of Arabic words come into Hebrew through the Palmach and through the, through the Arab section of the Palmach. So in the Palmach, these guys are like superheroes because they can do something that no one else in Palestine at that time can do. They can cross the lines. They can go to Jaffa as Arabs and sit in a cafe and come back with intelligence. So they're kind of superheroes in the Palmach and people come to see them. They have campfires where, as you mentioned, they sing Arabic songs and they make Arabic they make Arab coffee, black coffee. And it's in one way a celebration of, of Arab culture and in, in, um, in another way, I think what, it's what we would call in 2019, othering. They're, it's kind of a spectacle and people are interested in it but it's seen as something very strange and different. So their role in all of this is very, very complicated but the irony of it is that the very characteristic that prevents them from integrating becomes their ticket into the to the Zionist movement and into the very heart of the Zionist movement, which is the Palmach. 
we're going to talk about these guys a, a little bit more, but I, I want to take you back a little bit into the, into the writing process. Um, this is your third book. They are all for sale outside afterwards, and you'll be signing them for people, I understand. Um, and your first book uh, was about the Aleppo Codex, uh, about this mysterious and amazing uh, manuscript of the Bible, a thousand years old, that disappears, turns up in Jerusalem, and then its pages start going missing. Um, and then your next book was about your experiences uh, as a soldier in Lebanon, in the Israeli security zone in South Lebanon. And then in your third book, it strikes me, you return to the country where you served as a soldier in the company of the smugglers and shifty characters who populated your first book. So your third book appears to kind of grow out of your first two books. Um, but I wondered how you decided to write it. Was this a, a subject that you had thought about for years and thought I must write about that? Was it something you stumbled across? How, how did you come to even address this subject? I think that I, I, I'm, I am constantly being drawn, not in a conscious way, but north to Lebanon and Syria. And I think that has, it must have, I'm not much at analyzing my uh, my innermost being, but um, it must have something to do with the fact that when I arrived in Israel in the mid-1990s, I was drafted and almost immediately found myself not in Israel, which is where I thought I was moving, <laughs> but in Lebanon at an outpost that was a few miles north of the Israeli border called Dlat, Outpost Pumpkin. And I remember standing at Dlat, this was 1998 or so, and I came again with these stories about Europe and I was living on a kibbutz and, and, and I was in this, on this hilltop in South Lebanon. And we were fighting Shia Muslims. And our allies were Arabic-speaking Christians. And the guys who were with me in this outpost weren't exactly what I was expecting. They came from all kinds of different places, including places that were pretty close to where the outpost was. And here I was in the Middle East. And I was a Canadian, I was a 17-year-old Canadian when I came here. And suddenly I was in this absolutely bewildering region to which I had paid almost no thought because that's not what I thought I was doing when I, was, when I moved to Israel. And I think since then, more or less, I've been trying to figure it out. Um, and I've been trying to figure it out mainly for myself. Uh, luckily, I kind of, you know, you, I can get paid to do it, uh, being a journalist, but it's mostly for me. And I've, I've written books that are an attempt to kind of unpack that in different ways and not just unpack the Middle East and figure out where I am and figure out what my place in all of this is, but to figure out this place in the Middle East and to stop seeing it as kind of some foreign implant here or as a group of people who happen to have been dumped here um, but could have been anywhere. Uh, I think that th this country can only be understood as a Middle Eastern country. And its story can only be understood in the context of the Middle East. And Western observers don't want to do that, I think, because it's so far from them. People want the story to be about them. Um, but it, it might not be. It might be a story about the Middle East. So in all three books, I'm trying to understand that a bit, a bit better. Um, in the first case, it was about a Bible. And in the second case, it was about a military outpost. And in this case, it's about... Um, Okay. Um, in this case, it's about four spies. Is it better? Um, but and, I think that the, the quest is the same. And how did you find these spies? How did, you, how did you find this story? When I was writing my first book, which is the Aleppo Codex, one of the main characters in that book, it's a nonfiction book, one of the main characters is an old spy <laughs> named Rafi Siton who is quite an incredible character from Aleppo originally, long, interesting career in the Mossad. And at some point he told me that I should meet his friend, an even older spy named Yitzhak Shoshan. And I didn't know why I was supposed to go meet Yitzhak Shoshan, but as I read in the book, I have learned that if someone tells you, or someone offers to introduce you to an old spy, <laughs> just go. You won't regret it. That's not going to be a waste of time. So I went to meet Yitzhak Shoshan. He lives in a tiny apartment in Batyam on the seventh floor of a very Soviet-style workers block of apartments. And I took the little elevator up to the seventh floor, and he was waiting for me at the door. He's about this tall, you know? Um, and he was almost 90. And he sat me down in his kitchen and told me the craziest story I'd ever heard about 1948 and it corresponded to none of the stories that I knew about 1948. I thought I knew the history, but he told me the story of this little unit called the Arab Section. 
that picked up basically st street kids. Yes, we'll try to talk louder. Talk louder. Um, they picked up kids who were almost almost street kids, people on the margins of of Jewish society in Palestine, and sent them off on a pretty pretty incredible and pretty dangerous adventure in 1948. And when he told me that story, I, I realized that this was one of those stories that I'm looking for, which is an overlooked story that's on the margins of people's awareness, but something that says something really important about the country. And it took me years to put it together. From Isaac, I found other testimonies left behind by his comrades, all of whom had passed away. He was the only one still alive. And then I went to the military archive and I tried to get files declassified from 1948. They were still secret, the Arab section files. And I got some of them declassified and that whole mix ended up being this book, Spies of No Country. Um, Isaac's still alive, by the way, he's, he's 94. And I had the, um, the pleasure of giving him a copy of this book. I wasn't sure I was gonna have a, a chance because it took so long to put it together, but I, as soon as I had an advanced copy of the book, I ran to Batyam and I gave him a copy of the book. He won't read it, but uh, he, does, he doesn't know English uh, and he's 94, but he saw that there's a picture of himself on the cover and I think he was happy. Now, when you, when you talk about these guys being sent back into the Arab world, um, when we think of that now, we think of, of people being sent uh, across the border into Syria, into Lebanon, but, um, and, and other places. But, but back then, it was almost being sent across the street wasn't it? It was the, 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 the War of Independence is, is breaking out in 1947, 48. Um, there's, um, uh, there's, there's trouble between the different communities, the, the, the Jewish community and the Arab community in the same town, like in, in Haifa. And, and there's one incident that you talk about there uh, where, where they're actually sent just a couple of streets away to go and blow something up. Um, it, in Haifa, uh, how did they, how did they cope with moving just across a couple of streets and having to completely change their identity? As it's not quite changing your identity in a phone box, but it's it's not much more. So they used to be sent out from the Jewish part of Haifa, and it was a matter literally of crossing the street. So Isaac, for example, his disguise was usually as a worker. He would go in with kind of dirty clothes and he would set out from Jewish Haifa as Yitzhak Shoshan, whose original name, by the way, was Zaki Shasho. So he had Hebraicized his name to become part of the Zionist movement. And he was now Yitzhak Shoshan. But then when he crossed the lines, he became Abdul Karim Muhammad Sidki. That was his Muslim identity. And he would change his behavior in certain subtle ways. And he would be on the other side of the street where he could be killed if he conjugated a verb wrong. And this was life and death, and half of the agents in the Arab section, there were about a dozen of these guys active at the beginning of the war, half of them are caught and executed because they're not good enough. They weren't trained in any, there was no spy school. They were winging it, and if you got a detail wrong in your cover story, or if there was something off about your clothing or your accent, which in the, in the Arab world is a big deal, um, accents differ from village to village and from sect to sect. So if something's off, if you say you're from Jerusalem, but you sound like you're from the north, that someone's gonna notice. And, um, and some of these guys don't, don't make it. Um, Isaac is one of two agents who's sent on one of their first big missions, which was in Haifa, it's the one you mentioned, at the beginning of the 1948 war, an Arab militia in Haifa is preparing a truck bomb to go off at a movie theater in Haifa. And it's being disguised as a British army ambulance. And the intelligence services, which are very, you know, not what, not what we have now, they pick up this ambulance in a, in a garage in Haifa and they decide that they have to get rid of it somehow, but this is before the creation of the state. The British are still in control. The, the Jews don't have an air force or artillery or anything that would really resemble an, an actual army. So the only way they can deal with this is subterfuge and they dispatch two agents with their own car bomb to blow up the other car bomb. <laughs> and they have to talk their way through a few checkpoints and, um, and they eventually succeed. And that mission ends up kind of coming back to haunt them in an interesting way at the end of, at the, end of the story. 
Um, I don't know if I want to get into too many details, but that um, kind of a ghost, a ghost fr uh, from that incident comes back to haunt these guys uh, later in this, later on their, uh, their adventure. But getting in and out of this garage was a matter of bluffing and a matter of disguise. Gamliel in Haifa, and this is one of the incidents that opens the book, had a really kind of uh, a series of mishaps that really show what these guys had to deal with. He's in Haifa at the very beginning of the war, a few weeks after three guys from the Arab section were caught and killed. And he has to get to a travel agent to pick up a ticket for a flight from Haifa to Beirut. And he's in Haifa, and he's speaking to people on the street, and there's something about Gamliel, or Yusuf al Hamid that is throwing, that is, it's making people suspicious. People understand that there's something off about this guy. And two militiamen approach him, they're armed, and they want to take him aside which would have been the end of him, and he has to bluff his way out. They think he's a Jew. There's something about him that's flagging him, and they think he's a Jew pretending to be an Arab. He's saved by a Christian Arab in Haifa and manages to get to the airport in Haifa to catch his flight, where he meets a Jew from Damascus who knows him. So he's pretending to be a Muslim named Yusuf al Hamid. This Jew from Damascus knows he's a Jew named Jamil Cohen, and that's also very dangerous. So he manages to evade this guy. He gets to Beirut. He spends a few weeks in Beirut and then has to come back to Palestine to get new instructions and, and money. He's in Tel Aviv on his way to uh, Palmach headquarters when he's grabbed by two Jewish militiamen who think he's an Arab. And he's bundled into a car and blindfolded and is in grave danger and he speaks Hebrew to them but his Hebrew is spoken with an Arabic accent because he's from Damascus and they don't believe him and only when he's thrown into this room with Palmach commanders and his blindfold is taken off does he see one of the commanders who he knows and this commander tells the kind of the hoodlums who had dragged him in they say no 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 this isn't the enemy this is the Arab section and that was their life in those days. Now, as you say, some of them are actually dispatched to Beirut, um, and they, they get there by boat, I think, in the end. In the middle of the night, they're dumped on a beach, and they're just they're sent in uh, to find um, a place to live. They have to set up a business. They have to set up a radio using um, a clothesline as, a, as an aerial, and they start transmitting, but basically, they have no idea what's going on back home. They have no idea what they're actually supposed to do and no real way of receiving clear instructions on what they should do. So what did they actually do there every day as spies in Beirut during the War of Independence? So it starts out in April 1948. That's when the first agents go. They're sent with the refugees, with the Arab refugees who are fleeing Haifa. The Palmach understands that this is an opportunity to get the first spies into Lebanon. And they plant them with their Arab identities in the stream of refugees, and they end up in Beirut, where they spend the first two years of Israel's existence living as Palestinian refugees. And when they get there initially, they don't have a radio. So they're sent with nothing. They have no way to communicate. The border is cut in May 1948, and they have no idea what's going on south of the border. So all of the information that they have about uh, Israel is coming from Arabic newspapers in the first weeks that they're there. And the Arabic newspapers are reporting that the Arab armies are victorious and that the Jewish enclave is being eradicated and that the Arab armies are in, the, the Arab Liberation Army is in Haifa and the Egyptians are almost in Tel Aviv and they have no way of knowing if any of it's true. So now in 2019, we know, of course, how this works out. But in 1948, they had no idea and there was a good chance that they had just been dispatched into the Arab world by a state that would not exist, that would have been stillborn and they could have been stranded in the Arab world. No one would have come looking for them and they joked at the time that that was okay because they could always go back to Palestine as Arabs. <laughs> they had a built-in plan B. Eventually, they get a radio and they 
understand that the Jews are holding out, the price is incredible. I mean, 1% of the Jewish population here dies in that war. A lot of their friends die in that war, but the state is somehow holding out. And then they begin to get instructions over their clothesline. <laughs> they have a Morse transmitter and the, the antenna is disguised as a clothesline and they start getting these tapped messages from this country called Israel where they've never been because they left before it was founded. Um, and what the Israelis, Israelis are interested in is initially what's going on with the refugees. They want to know what's happening with the Palestinian refugees. Um, then they want to know about military preparedness. They want to know about morale on the Arab street. They want to know what Arab leaders are saying, what leaders in Lebanon are saying, and the spies get all, all that stuff. They open up a kiosk where they sell sandwiches and candy, and they open up the kiosk not just as a cover story, but because they need to make money. They don't really have any money. It's not the Mossad. You know, if you were kind of imagining the Israeli secret service that we know from its mythology, this is really not, it's just not that. The, the headquarters at the time is just a corner of a shed on a kibbutz called Givat Shlosha. There's a picture of it in the book. It's just a wooden table with a Morse transmitter. That's Israeli intelligence, more or less. And these guys in Beirut who have very little idea what they're doing, eventually they get assigned a pretty complicated sabotage mission involving Adolf Hitler's yacht. That's a strange story that's in this book. And uh, they have other missions as the, the thing kind of unfolds until in 1950, the Arab section is brought back to the state of Israel. Uh, not really back, I guess, because they hadn't never been here. Um, and the Palmach ceases to exist with the return of the Arab section. The Palmach had been dismantled in 1948, except for the Arab section because they weren't here. So it's the last part of the Palmach to be dismantled in the spring of 1950, and then a lot of these guys, the surviving ones, get um, kind of taken into the world of, of Israeli intelligence, and many of them go on to kind of storied careers in, in the Mossad after that. Hitler's yacht. <laughs> what was Hitler's yacht doing in Beirut, and what, what were they supposed to do about it? It's a great question. Uh, it's not a story that I'd ever heard when I was researching this book. It seems like it should be more famous than it is. I think it was famous maybe back then, but in the fall of 1948, when these guys are in Beirut, the, they notice that there's a, a Nazi warship, a small Nazi warship um, anchored in Beirut. And it turns out not to be just any Nazi boat. It's a Viso grill which was Hitler's personal yacht. It was an armed yacht, and it was built for Hitler in the 30s. It was the ship that he was supposed to sail up the Thames to accept the British surrender in London. That was the plan. And that didn't pan out, luckily for you, and I guess luckily for all, luckily for all of us. And uh, it, it plays a, a small role in World War II. It disappears after the war and resurfaces in Beirut, Lebanon, in the fall of 1948. And of course, Israeli intelligence, whatever that was, five months after the state was founded, is very interested in this, in this ship for two reasons, one official and one unofficial. The official reason is that they're worried that the Egyptian Navy is going to get its hands on this ship and use it against the Israeli Navy. And the Israeli Navy in, in the fall of 1948, much like Israeli intelligence, was just wishful thinking. It didn't exist. It was just a few old ships that they'd found lying around Haifa that they'd refitted with some very light weapons, it was nothing to be taken too seriously, and this small warship could have made a difference in the Mediterranean. So they decide that they have to get rid of it, but the real reason, it's pretty clear from the radio transmissions, is that they really want to sink Hitler's yacht. <laughs> that, you know, the state of Israel, the, the, the tragedy, we think a lot about, um, you know, the, the, the victory, I guess, in the founding of the state of Israel, but the, the founding of the state is in many ways a tragedy, because, I mean, for many reasons, but it happens too late. The state of Israel doesn't save the people it's meant to save. Right? We get the remnants, and we end up saving the Jews of the Islamic world. But the Jews of Europe who are supposed to move here are gone by the time the state is founded. And in 1948, this is all incredibly fresh. People still don't know if their relatives are alive or dead. People don't know if Hitler's alive or dead in 1948. So this is all still going on. The Jews have missed their chance to fight in that war, to win that war, but they can strike a symbolic blow by sinking this ship. And they put into motion what, at the time, was an incredibly complicated sabotage operation. It's the kind of thing that Israel becomes famous for later on. This was the first time, it was the first one. They take an aerial photograph, a really big deal in 1948. They land a frogman in Beirut with magnetic mines. 
to sink the ship. They use the Arab section spies in Beirut to take photographs of the ship, and there's a photograph in the book, and they put into motion this very complicated and very dangerous operation with the goal of sinking Hitler's yacht. Like many operations, and I think like many true life spy stories, it doesn't quite work out as planned. Um, maybe I'll leave it. I'll leave it there. But it's a great, uh, it's a great episode that I that was completely new to me when I started working on this. The other thing that nearly sinks them is they they get lonely in in Beirut. They're there for years and years. They're by themselves, and um, Isaac strikes up a relationship with a local woman. How how does that work out? Uh, poorly, as you might imagine. Um, <laughs> For the, for the woman, um, maybe more, for Isaac, more than for Isaac, at the very beginning of the Arab section, which is in 1941, it's actually founded, just as a parenthetical aside, by the British Special Operations Executive. That's where this thing really starts. In 1941, there's a panic in Palestine because the Germans seem to be about to arrive. And the British freak out and the Jews freak out. And one thing that happens is the Special Operations Executive sets up a few units that are supposed to carry out dirty tricks. One is called the German section, which is made up of German Jews who are supposed to pretend to be Wehrmacht soldiers. And they're trained in German uniforms. So they sing Nazi songs. Um, they're incredible descriptions of what the German section was. And they set up the Arab section, which is Arabic speaking Jews who are supposed to operate behind Nazi lines in the Arab world. At that time, they understand that it's a bad idea to send men by themselves into the Arab world both because of loneliness and because single men attract attention in the Arab world. And they try to find women who can also be mistarvot. The problem is, if you know the world of uh, Jews from the Islamic world, parents from that world are not into sending their unmarried daughters on crazy adventures with men they're not related to. Um, so they really have very little luck. Um, they find a few women, mostly Yemeni women, and they train them. They're given some kind of uh, knife training and some language training, but eventually that whole scheme is abandoned. And when these guys are sent into the Arab world, they're sent in alone. It's just men. And that leads to all kinds of complications because these are men in their early 20s. They're alone. This thing lasts two years. They spend two years in Beirut. And there are a few entanglements. The most um, dangerous one was Isaac's entanglement with um, a girl named Georgette, who was a Maronite Christian from Beirut. And he is a Muslim from Palestine whose name is Abdul Karim. And they meet playing volleyball on the beach in Beirut. They strike up a relationship. They seem to, be, to have been quite serious, if you read between the lines. It ends, or it almost ends, when Georgette's brother ambushes Isaac, otherwise known as Abdul Karim, in, uh, in a dark doorway. And he pushes him up against the wall and pulls out a knife. Her brother was a fishmonger, and he had a really big knife. And he pins Isaac to the wall and pulls out his knife and said, you better leave my sister alone. We don't date Muslims. And Isaac says, when he, Isaac was a Jew, of course, and if they'd only known, I don't think that would have made it better necessarily, but he, uh, he, he says that he, it was then he realized that your chances of getting killed in Lebanon because of sectarian tensions were much greater than being killed because you were a spy. Um, the, the relationship with Georgette doesn't quite end there, and when Isaac is pulled out and brought back to Israel and replaced by another agent, she pursues the spies in Beirut. She's onto something. She understands that something is off about these guys who mysteriously have no relatives, and she understands that, something, uh, that there's something wrong about them, and it almost sinks the whole operation in Beirut, which is wrapped up shortly thereafter. So, love, sabotage, death, execution, jealousy, an everyday story of, of spies abroad. Um, we're gonna take some, do we have some microphones for questions? Yeah, we, we're gonna take some questions uh, in a moment. Um, uh, please wait until the microphone reaches you because we are broadcasting on the web and people won't be able to hear you and we won't be able to hear you um, until you have the microphone. Just put up your hand if you'd like to ask a question. Um, and while you're, while you're uh, thinking about just one last thing I want to ask you, which is you spent many years as a, as a daily news reporter churning out stories, sometimes more than one story every day, uh, and now you write books, 
which I guess each one takes, what, a year uh, or more to write. How, how do you, and you've done that, you've made that transformation very successfully. How do you make that transformation? What, what have you had to change about the way you work in order to, to stop being a reporter and, and become an author instead? I found after years of working in the daily journalism world, which of course you know well, that there's just no way to penetrate the surface. You end up kind of skating around the surface of the pond and you'll never get at what's going on underneath. And just the, the format of a 600 word or 900 word news story it does not do justice to the complexity of what life is or what this place is beyond all of the other political problems that I experienced in the press corps and a kind of a, a tendency toward heavily simplified narratives, heavily moralistic narratives. And I just had, had enough of it and I uh, went, to, went off to do this. And this is much more time consuming, of course, but it does actually allow you to access the, the guts of, of the story. If you spend a couple years working on one of these stories, you start off with one assumption about it and then within a few months, you have a different understanding of it. And then after a year, you have a different understanding of it. My first interview with Isaac was in 2011. And this book was just published. And in those years that I, I had the luxury of spending years thinking about this story and my understanding of the story evolved, if I'd had to crank out a story, you know, within two days, I interview Isaac on Tuesday, get the AP story out on Wednesday, I would have understood nothing. So um, news is very important, of course, and it needs to be done well, but it's such a limited form that I felt that I wasn't, I wasn't gonna be able to, uh, to do what I wanted to do if I stayed in that world. So not just therapy for your identity, but occupational therapy as well. That's right, it's all about, it's all about me. Yeah. Good, good, so it should be. Do we have any, do we have any questions? Yeah, here, down, down here in the front. Just wait for the microphone, please. If you could keep your questions short and with a question mark on the end, that would be great. One of your characters remarks that what his leaders who sent him out never got was the tremendous importance of revenge, and not revenge for tomorrow or next week, but decades and centuries of the importance of revenge in the Middle East never sank in to the people who sent them out. Do you think that that has changed in the leadership after 70 years? I tried to gauge the political leanings of these spies uh, in different ways. The only one who I could actually speak to was Isaac Shoshan. And I, um, I tried to get him, I tried to ask him different questions to kind of draw him out on what he thinks about you know, the chances of peace here, or the chances of reconciliation here. And these guys were very, very interesting because they were humanists. I mean, they were from the Arab world, they did not, look down on the Arab world. They took people from the Arab world very seriously. They took their religion seriously. They took their hostility very seriously. They lived among them and were part of them in, in many ways. They understand the pain of the other side. Among the first Israelis who really get what the refugee problem is are these guys. They're in Amman and they meet the refugees in 1948, 49, and they're reporting back about what this problem is and they're saying this is not going away. People aren't just going to move on after what happened. So they're, they're Zionists, they're part of the cause, they're willing to die for the cause, some of them do die for the cause, but they're also human observers of, of the other side. So I asked Isaac, you know, what, what's going what's gonna to happen, you know? And he, Isaac's from Aleppo, he's from a very poor family in Aleppo, his father was a janitor, and he grew up in the alleys of Aleppo, basically, and he was picked up here selling peppers from a crate in the uh, Carmel market in Tel Aviv. And he gets sent off on this adventure and I asked him what he thought and he told me a story, which was very Isaac. He didn't answer the question directly, but he told me a story. He said, once there was a Bedouin whose brother was killed by someone from a neighboring tribe. And um, in the Bedouin tribal code, you have to avenge your brother's death. Um, and he doesn't. He doesn't avenge his brother's death that year Five years go by, he doesn't do it. 10 years go by, he still hasn't done it. 30 years go by, nothing. 40 years go by, and he finally avenges the death of his brother, and the tribal elders come to him and say, why did you hurry? <laughs> and and what, he, what he meant was that things are deep here, and the idea that you sign a, pe a piece of paper and you make it go away is not the way it works. And I think these guys definitely, they, this had to be done. They understood why Jews needed a state here. They understood it maybe better than some of the people who came from Europe. They understood the price maybe better than people who came from Europe. They didn't expect this to be resolved in a peace agreement in 1949.
which was the expectation of many of the leaders here. And they didn't expect it to be resolved in a peace agreement in 1992. And I think they wouldn't expect it now. Uh, they had a very different take on it. So they were humanists. They were sympathetic to the other side. I wouldn't say that they were they were right wing, but they were very realistic about the Middle East. They didn't have illusions about the Middle East or about what the price of the founding of this country was, not just to us, but to to our neighbors. Okay, We're over here, yeah. yeah. Um, when you talk about uh, your interviews with, with Isaac, uh, it makes me wonder, do you also search for converging evidence in, in respect to supporting the stories that you get, or do you simply rely on the anecdotal memories of, of that person? That, that's a great question. I mean, you, uh, you, if you try to recount something that happened to you five years ago, you'll find that that's very difficult, let alone events that happened 70 years ago. So you have to come at this with a lot of skepticism. And luckily here, I had the ability to cross-check a lot of what I was hearing because all or many of the characters in the in the Arab section left behind oral testimonies. We also have documents from the time. So Gamliel has an oral testimony, for example, that he recorded in the late 90s. He has a book that he wrote in 2001 that came out in Hebrew. And he has his documents that he wrote as a spy in 1947, 1948, which still exist in the Haganah archive. So there is a lot of material that allows you to cross check. With Isaac, I had that material and I also had different versions of some of those stories that he had told 20 years before or 30 years before. And in the case of Isaac, the accuracy was incredible. I mean, I'm not sure if he could tell you what happened to him two weeks ago with any accuracy. 1948, he remembered with incredible detail and with accuracy that was very, very impressive. I think that you might remember the formative events of your life better than you remember what you ate for breakfast. And that was, that was certainly true of him. So I was confident by the end, although I came in suspicious, I was confident by the end that the events as I described them are more or less the way they happened, or as close, as close to the way they happened as, as it is humanly possible to get in 2019. As a journalist myself who trained as a historian, I, I, I share your, uh, 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 your, your frustration at that, the, the news cycle of having to churn out the daily news story and only scratching the surface and, and, and having to take the first version of the first person you interview because you have a, a deadline. I think one of the things that impressed me most about the book was that you didn't take their stories at face value. You went to the archives, you went back to the memoirs, you, you got those papers um, released un, under the Freedom of Information and, and declassified um, and, and decensored which means that, that the material you have in there is not just a bunch of recollections of old men. It's, it's a real history that has a lot of documentation. You even have dozens of photographs in there of these guys in Beirut, in these strange places, uh, doing these strange things, which I think is it's a remarkable achievement of the book. That's something, first, certainly something I enjoyed. We, we had another question up, yeah, up there. Thank you. Um, is this mic on? Yes. yes. Uh, I know you just finished the book, and uh, my question relates uh, indirectly to your next book, uh, having enjoyed the first two. Give me some time, man. I, well, I'm I, just <laughs> being here tonight, I didn't want to give you the time. I wanted to ask in advance. When you prepared the book, and uh, I haven't read it, I have it in my hand now, you focused apparently on four um, individuals. Would you say that there's a capability of being a sequel, uh, meaning you discovered and learned that much information that you had to cut it and finish and uh, move on? And is there much more depth to this uh, when you talk about not doing a daily report, but rather an in-depth report? How much more history could we write about? I think that in the case of the Arab section, this is more or less what there is to say about these guys in 1948. Um, what's interesting to me is what happened to some of them after 1948, which is much more complicated to write about because some of those files, or all of those files essentially, are still secret. So for example, Gamliel Cohen, Jamil, Yusuf El Hamed, goes on to be one of Israel's longest undercover agents. He uses the same identity, Yusuf El Hamed, and he lives for years and years and years as an Arab journalist 
operating in Europe and sometimes in, in Africa. His cover is so deep that his children are born under a cover identity. His daughter, who I just met a few days ago, she lives in Tel Aviv, uh, her name's Mira, but she was born with the name Samira, which is an Arab name, and they called her Samira because they knew that they would come back to Israel one day and drop the Sa, and then she would have a Hebrew name, Mira. So Gamliel's story is an incredible story, and I don't know the details, but I would love to write them. <laughs> when he died, one of Israel's best military historians, Meir Pa'il, said that he was one of Israel's greatest spies. We've never heard of him because he was never caught. You hear about the spies who get caught. We all know Eli Cohen, um, who penetrated the Syrian regime in the 60s um, because he was caught and hung in Damascus in 65. But we don't know about the other Eli Cohens, like Jamil Cohen, who didn't get caught. Yakuba, who is another one of my four. He's the toughest. He's kind of a very blustery, kind of swaggering character, a great storyteller, probably the bravest guy in the Arab section. He goes on to an incredible career in Israeli intelligence, which includes having plastic surgery at some point that changed the way he looked. So early pictures of Yakuba are very different than late pictures of, of Yakuba. He's still uh, called back to, by the intelligence services into his late 70s, uh, shortly before he dies. So if I could write another book, it would be about that, what happens to the Arab section guys, the ones who survive in the new, in the new state of Israel. Whether or not I'll actually write that book is uh, a different story, but I would like to. Okay, we have time for one more. With all the research that you've done in that 48 period, could you make a comment about what led all this conflict between the Arabs and the Jews back then, before the, before the state? Oh, that's, that's very simple. Uh, <laughs> just four or five hours and I'm done with that question. You guys have, um, when you see things through the eyes of these men, it, it's complicated. So I think that one way of looking at it is that Jews escaped Europe. They had to save themselves. They came up with this idea called Zionism and the idea of going back to the biblical homeland and reconstitute, re reconstituting Jewish sovereignty here. And the arrival of Zionism, which is a European idea in the Middle East, generates conflict with the people who are here, the, with the Islamic world that existed here and wasn't interested in ceding sovereignty over any part of the, of the Islamic world. So that's one way of seeing it, and that's not false. That's definitely part of what happened. But when you see it through the eyes of these guys, you see it a bit differently. Because if half of the Jews in Israel are native to the Islamic world, that means that the state of Israel is a product of a population movement inside the Islamic world as much as it is a product of a movement from Europe. So even if we disregard for a moment the European side of Israel's identity, you can see the, the state of Israel as a, a solution inside the Islamic world to a problem caused by the Islamic world, which is the expulsion of one million native Jews uh, beginning in the 1940s. And there are many reasons that that way of seeing things isn't popular. Uh, some of them are our fault and some of them are not our fault. For example, in, um, in the Arab world, it's become um, um, accepted to speak of this as a colonial project. If you go to Egypt, for example, and you go to the Egyptian memorial to the crossing of the Suez Canal in 73, one of the great moments of Egyptian military history, you'll see there's a mural that depicts Israeli soldiers surrendering to heroic Egyptian soldiers. They're clasping their hands like this and raising their hands like this, and the Israeli soldiers are blonde. All of the Israelis are blonde. Now, if you've ever seen an Israeli army unit, you know that the soldiers are not blonde. <laughs> in fact, they look a lot like Egyptians, a lot of them. And in fact, some of the Israeli soldiers on the Suez Canal in 73 were Egyptians. But that makes it really complicated because why, what happened to all the Jews of Cairo? There were 80,000 Jews in Egypt in the 40s. Where did they all go? What happened to a quarter million Jews in Morocco? Where did all the Jews of Syria go? What happened to them? What happened to their property? And that would require the Islamic world or the Arab world asking itself very thorny questions about itself. So it's best to, just to pretend that everyone's blonde. And in a weird way, we've played into that because we liked being blonde. So part of the Zionist idea was to become European. And the early propaganda photos of pioneers in the fields were blonde guys, you know, hoeing the field. And they would, you know, hoe the field in the day and listen to Beethoven at night. And that was part of what, part of the story we were telling ourselves. And it's still a powerful story, so powerful that it has obscured the fact that half of the people here 
are from the Islamic world, and you can see it just by turning on, you know, looking out your window or turning on the radio. Uh, so by telling this European story about ourselves and, and pushing this story to the margins and pretending that the arrival of Jews from the Islamic world is just a footnote you know, to, a, to a European story, we've shot ourselves in the foot politically by playing into the narrative of colonialism, uh, by secretly being pleased that we're being portrayed as blonde. Um, Israel, if Israel is a problem, um, it's a problem generated in large part by the Arab world, not by Europe, not just by Europe. And I think that it's a good idea to see things that way, both um, to uh, be able to present our case better and also mainly, I think, in order to understand ourselves um, understand ourselves better. So these four guys, your, your four protagonists in the book, they, they leave their childhood homes where they grew up in an Arab milieu. They come to a Hebrew-speaking milieu where they're basically rejected because they're too Arab. They're then recruited because they're Arab um, and they're then sent off to go back into the Arab world um, to be secret Jews who are pretending to be Arabs. Um, and then, uh, after a while, they're brought home again. And some of them continue careers in intelligence. But where does that leave these people? Um, how confused are they about their identity? And how much does it affect the rest of their, of their lives, their personal lives? Did you get any, any impression of that from talking to Isaac or, or from... Um, from reading about the others? I think that this accompanied them their entire life. And I think that in their recollections of those times, they describe themselves as Israeli agents as a way of simplifying things. But when they leave on their mission, they're not Israelis. There is no Israel. What they are is something much more complicated. They're Jews from the Arab world. Maybe they're a Arabs. It's kind of hard to define them exactly. Some of them think of themselves as, as Arabs. So they call themselves mistarvim, or ones who become like Arabs, but it's a pretty good question. Are they pretend, how much of this is fiction? Are they pretending to, to be Arabs, or are they people who are pretending not to be Arabs, who are pretending to be Arabs? So this is all very, very complicated and confusing, and if you just think of them as Israeli agents, you miss everything that's interesting about this story. Their children lose their Arabness because the idea of the Zionist movement was to create people who would not have this double identity problem, right? We, didn't, we weren't gonna be Polish Jews or Russian Jews or Canadian Jews or Arab Jews. We we're just gonna be Jews called Israelis and we're gonna speak Hebrew. So their kids don't speak Arabic, their grandchildren don't speak, don't speak Arabic. And I think for these guys, it was, it was complicated. Their souls were Arab. And the, there, there was a break in 1948 when their home world became the enemy. And some of them channeled that into intelligence work, and some of them you know, listened to Um Kulthum every evening, and they dealt with it in different ways. But when you meet them, and when you meet Isaac, he's, you know, he's not from Warsaw. He's from Aleppo, which is not very far away from here, and that's very much part of who he is. And it's part of half of the Jewish population of of Israel in ways that are complicated and worth paying more attention to, I think. Well, congratulations on a fabulous book. Um, I'd like to ask you just to stay in your seats while we get Matty outside so he can actually sign those books for you. Uh, thank you so much to Bet Avichai. Uh, for hosting tonight's event. Thank you very much for coming, and we look forward to seeing you soon.